There is another drawing style that is often used when dealing with a compound containing multiple chirality center. These drawings are known as Fisher projection method or Fisher projection formulas and they were developed by a German chemist named Emil Fischer. He devised these uh, formulas in 1891 while he was working uh, on uh, or investigating various sugars. Now all naturally occurring sugar molecules contain multiple chirality centers and it was uh, uh, relatively difficult to keep track of uh, all those uh, chirality centers if we draw the molecules in the usual two-dimensional way. So he devised this method uh, to quickly uh, point out or quickly investigate the chirality centers in those sugars. So even today, all carbohydrates, which are essentially sugars, are represented in uh, Fisher projection formulas. An example of a molecule which has only one chiral center is uh, represented here and its uh, mirror image is also shown here. One thing you would notice is that this molecule is oriented in such a way that the vertical bonds are away from the viewer or away from us. However, the horizontal bonds uh, like these ones are coming towards the viewer. This is important uh, beginning point uh, in drawing Fisher projection formulas. In order to uh, write the Fisher projection formula, molecule must be oriented in such a way that the vertical bonds are away from the viewer and horizontal bonds are towards the viewer. And then, the bonds are simply replaced by simple lines and this is the Fisher projection. In Fisher projection, it is understood that the vertical bonds are uh, into the plane or away from the viewer, whereas horizontal bonds are towards the viewer. So just to review one more time, the horizontal segments uh, in Fisher projection represents those bonds which are coming towards you and the vertical segments represents bonds that are away from you. So it means only atom which is in the plane is the central carbon atom. All other are either above the plane or below the plane. Therefore, Rotation of these uh, Fisher projections by 90 degree are not permissible because if we rotate 90 degree, they, the structure does not mean the same because if you rotate 90 degree, uh, uh, it will not maintain the, uh, the condition of vertical bonds being away from you and horizontal being towards you. Fisher projections are primarily used for analyzing sugars or carbohydrates. Uh, in addition, Fisher projections are also helpful for quickly comparing the relationship between stereoisomers. We can easily identify if um, uh, stereoisomers are pair of enantiomers or if they are diastereomers. Uh, in order to draw a Fisher projection formula, so first we need to draw a three-dimensional formula uh, which is oriented so that vertical bonds from the chiral center are directed away from uh, you and horizontal bonds are directed towards you. Let me demonstrate with the help of an example. So imagine that we are drawing this molecule
So in this molecule, all the carbon atom on this parent uh, backbone, they are in the plane, whereas the OH group is coming towards us and the hydrogen is away from us. So now we need to orient the molecule in such a way that the OH group comes towards us. Uh, so how, let's try to flip this molecule this way by 90 degree. And if we do that, so then it will become Even now, the OH group is coming towards us and hydrogen is away from us. So now what we need to do is, we need to flip this way by 90 degree. So when we do that, I'm not sure if uh, it's gonna be uh, that easy to understand but we need to remember that we are moving this and this by 90 degree so kind of uh, let me give you an example so imagine that this is a person and this part is the head and these are like arms and these are and then the rest of this molecule is like its legs and this molly uh, this person or this molecule is looking towards this side and now i want this to look towards us so so it means the arms have to come towards us so that's why i'm saying that we need to now rotate this molecule towards us by 90 degree when we do that so it will end up looking like so head will be here so head is c o o h and because see the head is tilted this way right so it will be tilted backwards so it's and then that's the chest part that would also be moved away the arms both the arms so hydrogen will be on right hand side and the oh will be on this side so a arms are coming towards us right so it looks like it's hugging uh, it's trying to hug us right uh, so that's the chiral center, this one. Once we got it in this shape, now we can draw this molecule in Fisher projection, which would be so hydrogen on this side, OH on this side, and COOH here. So from here to here, that's how we transform the regular molecule into a Fisher projection. As I mentioned that Fisher projection formulas are extremely helpful in uh, identifying uh, 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 pair of enantiomers or diastereomers in carbohydrates or other systems which have more than one chirality center. So let me uh, show you a few examples. Uh, for example, if this is one of uh, uh, example of one of um, a sugar molecule uh, remember in fisher projection each intersection point of horizontal and vertical bond is a chiral center so it means it has one two and three chiral center so if there are three chiral centers so it means technically it should have two to the three eight uh, stereoisomers so drawing all those stereoisomers in a regular three-dimensional structure would be quite challenging but in case of Fisher projection it's actually extremely easy 
So starting from this number one structure, so first uh, stereoisomer would be the mirror image of number one. So mirror image of number one uh, will be, I'll try to use different colors, uh, would be OH in this side and H on that side, COOH remains the same and CH2OH remains the same. And second one would be OH here and H here. And so these two are enantiomers of each other. So they are also stereoisomers, but they are uh, enantiomers. Now that's number two. Now number three is, again, Let's keep the basic backbone. One thing I would like to point out that when you draw Fisher projection, make sure you connect the bond where it's supposed to be. This would be incorrect because this bond is not connected to oxygen. So the correct way of drawing is that it should be connected to carbon. Similarly, this should be connected to carbon, not to hydrogen or any other. So all you need to do is you need to switch one of the hydrogen and OH and keep the others uh, as such. For example, starting from number one, I'm going to switch the first hydrogen and OH, but I'll keep the others exactly the same way they were in uh, the number one. So this would be number three. As you can see that number three is also a stereoisomer of both number one and number two, but it's not the mirror image. So number three is diastereomer of both one and two. Now draw the mirror image of number three. So that would be the fourth stereoisomer. So number three and number four are pair of enantiomers. But they are diastereomers to each other. Now, now this molecule does not have any plane of symmetry. Uh, therefore, meso compounds does not exist in this case. So we will have a perfect eight uh, stereoisomers. Let's draw number five now. Again, in number five, what we will do is we'll now switch the middle OH and hydrogen from the number one. Everything else will remain the same. This is number five. Now draw the mirror image of number five, that will be our number six. So these two are also enantiomers of each other. But they are not mirror images of Five and six are enantiomer of each other, but they are diastereomers to all of number one to four. And all six are stereoisomers, all six. Excuse me, I, I believe I have made a mistake in number two. So number two technically should be hydrogen here. Let me redraw number two. I did not make the mirror image correctly.
then finally the last uh, two pairs are those in which we switch the final uh, OH and H and its mirror image of this one would be Now these two are also enantiomers of each other. So that would be number seven and number eight. So <clears throat> the point is that if we draw uh, our molecule which has a multiple chiral center in Fisher projection, it will be extremely easy to write all stereoisomers but if we keep the structure of our molecule in regular uh, three-dimensional representation such as ball and stick method uh, it will be almost impossible to draw all eight stereoisomers so that's why fissure projections are extremely helpful while figuring out uh, the various diastereomers and enantiomers in multi chiral center uh, molecules such as carbohydrates. We can analyze the stereoisomerism in cyclic compounds the same way as in linear molecules. Although uh, many different kinds of cyclic compounds with uh, multiple stereo centers exist in nature, however, we will concentrate mainly on uh, cyclic compounds with uh, five carbons or six carbons or in other words we will mainly focus on cyclopentane and cyclohexane uh, molecules so let's start with the two methyl cyclopentanone so it is a derivative of cyclopentane and cyclopentane is a molecule with five membered carbon ring structure 2-methylcyclopentanol has uh, two stereo centers as shown here. So therefore, we predict that it will have 2 to the 2 equals 4 stereoisomers. The general structure of 2-methyl cyclopentanol is shown here. Now, because it has two stereo centers, therefore, we predict that it uh, have uh, four stereoisomers. So, one obvious choice is the cis and trans uh, stereoisomer so therefore one would be the cis so so in case of cis both hydroxide and ch3 are in the same plane or in other words as shown here they are both coming towards the viewer or towards us now in trans one is coming towards us and the other one is in the other plane or in other words the other group is going away from us now both of these uh, uh, isomers these are cis trans isomers they are not enantiomers they are stereoisomers of each other therefore uh, because they are not mirror images of each other so therefore these two are diastereomers now both of these are chiral uh, and if we have a mirror in front of them so the mirror image will look so this would be the mirror image and the mirror image of the other one 
as I explained in the beginning, if we have wedge and dash bonds, just flip those bonds, make the wedge to dash and dash to wedge, and you will get your other enantiomer. So So if we put the mirror in the middle, so these two are mirror images of each other. So these two are enantiomers. Similarly, these two are also enantiomers. So therefore, these are the four stereoisomers of cyclic uh, or 2-methyl cyclopentanol. Now let's take an example of a 1, 2 cyclopentane diol. The molecule looks quite similar to the one which we saw in our previous slide. The general structure of this molecule is this one. Now the difference is in previous uh, uh, molecule, one group was OH, the other one was CH3. But in this case, both of these groups attached to the cyclopentane ring is OH. Again, we expect uh, uh, four stereoisomers, uh, but let's see if uh, that really is the case. So first, uh, we can, similar to the previous case, we can draw cis and trans. So in cis and trans, both OH, if on the one same side, and for trans, one, above the plane and other one is below the plane and then we can try to draw the mirror image so the mirror image is okay but if we try to draw the mirror image of this one uh, there is a problem because now there is a plane of symmetry passing right through it. This plane of symmetry did not exist in the previous example because one side was OH, the other one was CH3. But now because both sides are OH, therefore now there is a plane of symmetry. And we know that if there is a plane of symmetry, chirality does not exist. It's achiral now. If it's achiral, so its mirror image is exactly the same. So this, both of these are same molecule. Or in other words, this, these two are meso compounds. So it's the same molecule. So therefore, it has only three stereoisomers, where two of them are enantiomers, and then third one is a meso compound. Although uh, cyclohexane exists as a chair form, but for stereoisomer uh, identification purposes, it's uh, sometimes it's easier to uh, visualize this molecule as a planar ring structure. Following examples show the uh, stereoisomers of 3-methyl uh, cyclohexanol. In 3-methyl cyclohexanol, which has this general structure, again it has two stereo centers, therefore it must have four stereoisomers. And these stereoisomers are shown here. Two of them are cis 3-methyl cyclohexanol, where both of these uh, uh, OH group and CH3 uh, methyl group are above the plane. This can be shown and its mirror image. So let me redraw it. So mirror image of this would be
remember one thing when we are converting the wedge bond to dash bond then we do not flip the molecule it's already flipped so in other words if you draw it this way that would be incorrect this molecule is same as this one so let me take this out now if you are wondering uh, why uh, this is cis because uh, in chair form sometimes it could be challenging so we need to imagine that this is the plane where cyclohexane is and the OH group is although it's in equatorial position so it's above uh, see this side is above and similarly this side is also above so both are above the plane of cyclohexane so that's why it's cis similarly that's a plane uh, so this is above the plane and similarly this is above the plane so both are cis now if we look at it so this is the plane so that's below the plane and if this is the plane and this ch3 is above the plane so one is below the other one is above so that's why this is trans the like i said it's easier to visualize the enantiomers or stereoisomers if we draw cyclohexane in a uh, planar ring so for example in this case the planar ring structure of the same molecule would be this one and its stereoisomer would be so these two are enantiomers and these two are also enantiomers so together there are four stereoisomers and this and these these two are diastereomers of each other again uh, to review diastereomers are those stereoisomers which are not mirror images of each other interestingly four methyl cyclohexanol this molecule looks quite similar to the example we saw here however 4-methylcyclohexanol does not uh, have any stereoisomers or stereocenters. The reason is there is a plane of symmetry here. So along this plane of symmetry, the molecule is, uh, is symmetrical. So this plane of symmetry can be represented this way also. So we can see the molecule can be divided in two symmetrical halves so therefore this molecule is a chiral and we know a chiral molecule does not possess any uh, mirror images or therefore it does not have any stereoisomers so in this chapter we learned that uh, molecules who have same molecular formula but different structural formulas are known as isomers now difference in structure can be because of uh, uh, <clears throat> difference in connectivity and those isomers are known as constitutional isomer So constitutional isomers are those isomers where the connectivity between different atoms is different. Now if isomers have same connectivity but they their orientation in space is different or what we call they are non-superimposable then those kind of isomers are known as stereoisomers so stereoisomers have a same connectivity
but they are non superimposable now if stereo isomers are mirror images of each other then they are known as enantiomers and if they are not the mirror images of each other then they are known as diastereomers this table lists some of the properties of stereoisomers of tartaric acid on close inspection of this table you will find that uh, the uh, physical properties of uh, uh, enantiomers is exactly the same so first two uh, stereoisomers are mirror images of each other so therefore they are enantiomers and their properties are exactly same so we will learn about what is specific rotation in next uh, uh, section but <clears throat> uh, if we look at the magnitude of a specific rotation uh, it's exactly the same melting point is exactly the same density solubility are also the same similarly uh, pk and pk2 values are also the same however uh, the third stereoisomer which is diastereomer of the first two uh, their its properties are different so in other words uh, diastereomers have different uh, physical properties or but uh, enantiomers have exactly same properties in this chapter we have established that enantiomers are different compounds so if they are different compounds they must have different properties but previous slide uh, showed us the table in previous slide showed us that uh, uh, enantiomers have exactly the same density exact same melting point and exact same pka values so what is the difference uh, so the one property that differs between enantiomer is their effect on the rotation of plane polarized light so this is known as optical activity of enantiomers each member of a pair of enantiomer rotates the plane of polarized light in opposite direction for this reason enantiomers are said to be optically active so before we learn more about their optically uh, optical activity we need to learn about what is the meaning of plane polarized light we know that um, light is a electromagnetic radiation so which means that it has a electric component and a magnetic component in any single electromagnetic wave which is traveling in space it will have a oscillating electric component if uh, if the wave is traveling from left to right so that's the direction of propagation uh, and the red wave represents the electric component so this electric component is oscillating that's why it has a wave pattern but at the same time the wave also have a magnetic component and magnetic component is perpendicular to the electric component that's why this wave is known as electromagnetic radiation the orientation of electric component is known as the uh, polarization of light wave for example in this case the polarization is this way up and down so that's the polarization of this light wave uh, if a light wave is traveling from left to right uh, the electric component is perpendicular to that direction 
okay so we can represent this kind of polarization of this wave by a single vertical line uh, for example if this arrow represents the direction where the wave is traveling polarization of this wave is this okay <clears throat> now if we look at uh, waves coming from a light source uh, maybe a bulb the waves which come out of this one let's ignore the magnetic component because that does not interfere with uh, with the optical activity so uh, we only gonna focus on the electric component so I showed just one single wave here but when we have a light source uh, the light source will emit waves of electromagnetic radiation in all directions multiple waves so in that case some waves may have the electric component in the direction as shown here or in other words it may have a component in the direction vertical to this but some waves it may emit in which the electric component for example this wave in in this the vertical component may be slightly tilted right or in it may also emit some waves where the electric component is totally horizontal so in, in other words if this is the direction of propagation here so this wave will have the polarization on this side this wave will have the polarization of this side so in other words from a common light source the uh, the uh, waves which we get they are polarized in all directions randomly so we show uh, the common household light or any light even from the Sun or any light source it has a, a light in which is polarized in all directions so we show it this way so this means that light waves are oriented or polarized in all directions and so it means that they have electric component this way this way it, it looks messy but I hope you guys understand the concept so light waves are vibrating or oscillating in all directions and that's the, the representation of a light which uh, has polarized plane in all directions this kind of light is known as uh, non polarized light now by any mean if we somehow cut off all the waves in random random directions and let only one direction wave go through just single uh, direction waves so then all these waves now they have a uh, plane uh, of the polarization in just one plane so this kind of light is known as a plane polarized light so in plane polarized light light oscillates only in parallel planes only in one plane so to recap plane polarized light is a light in which uh, all electromagnetic radiations have electric component oscillating in just single plane whereas uh, if uh, light waves have uh, um, electric uh, plane oscillating in all random direction then the light is known as non polarized light as explained in previous slide ordinary light consists of waves vibrating in all planes perpendicular to its direction of propagation certain materials such as calcite or polaroid film 
they selectively transmit light waves vibrating only in parallel planes such radiation is known as plane polarized light now plane polarized light actually is a vector sum of uh, uh, left and right circularly polarized light so this would be the right circularly polarized and the left and plane polarized light is the sum of these two uh, 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 left and right circularly polarized uh, uh, vectors if we look carefully these two circularly polarized uh, uh, electric field vectors are mirror images of each other because uh, one is moving to the right direction the other one is moving to the left direction so in other words these two electric field vectors are enantiomers of each other so these are called light enantiomers these are not molecular enantiomers but light light enantiomers so because of their presence in the single plane polarized light so therefore uh, these uh, kind of light waves interact differently with the uh, with the molecular uh, enantiomers or in other words because uh, plane polarized light contains two electric uh, field vectors which are also enantiomers so therefore plane polarized light interact differently with molecules who are enantiomers of each other in simple words what will happen is that when the plane polarized light interacts with the uh, enantiomers or molecules who are enantiomers of each other such as some tetrahedral carbon atom so one of them will rotate the plane polarized to right hand direction the other enantiomer will rotate the uh, plane polarized light to the opposite direction so essentially uh, molecule which are enantiomers of each other they rotate the plane of the polarized light in opposite directions the interaction of plane polarized light with the uh, enantiomers was uh, first discovered by a french uh, scientist named john baptiste pierre He was exploring the nature of light by passing plane polarized light through various solutions of organic compounds. In doing so, he discovered that solutions of certain organic compounds such as sugars rotate the plane of plane polarized light. These compounds were therefore said to be optically active. And he also noted that only some organic compounds possess this quality compounds which lack this quality are known as optically inactive the rotation of plane polarized light caused by optically active compounds can be measured using a device called polarimeter a polarimeter consists of a monochromatic light source a polarizing filter and an analyzing filter and in the middle of polarizing and analyzing filter we have a sample uh, tube chamber the light source is generally a sodium lamp and uh, it has a fixed wavelength of 589 nanometer this wavelength of sodium light is known as a d line of sodium the light from the uh, sodium lamp is polarized in all directions as you can see by the direction of these arrows and when this uh, non polarized light pass pass through uh, the polarizing filter the filter cuts down all uh, the waves uh, except one single direction polarized 
light waves so hence after passing through the filter the light is polarized in single plane and this light is a plane polarized light this plane polarized light then passes through the sample tube the sample tube contains a solution of organic molecules which is optically active so as the plane polarized light passes through the uh, sample tube the molecules in this sample they interact with the light and they start rotating the plane of the light so therefore after the light passes through the filter the plane of the light will be rotated by some angle now how much angle uh, the plane gets rotated that depends on uh, the nature of the molecule some molecules rotate less some rotate more and even the direction depends on the molecule some molecules will rotate the light to the right side the others may rotate to the left side but anyway so when the light exits the sample tube the plane of the light will be rotated now in order for light to be visualized at the other end if we try to visualize it now we need to rotate the analyzing filter by the same angle otherwise this plane of the light will not be able to pass through it so in order to make this light pass through uh, the uh, analyzing filter the analyzing filter has to be rotated by that angle so that's how we can measure the angle by which uh, the molecules rotated the plane of the light the number of degrees through which the analyzing filter must be rotated to restore the view of the uh, plane polarized light is known as observed uh, rotation and it is denoted by a symbol alpha if the analyzing filter must be turned to the right or in other words clockwise to restore the view of the light we uh, say that the compound is dextrorotatory and it is denoted by a symbol uh, positive or plus sign the name dextrorotatory uh, uh, came from latin word dexter uh, which means uh, on the right side if the analyzing filter must be turned to the left or counterclockwise uh, to restore the view of the light then the compound is known as levorotatory it is denoted by the negative sign again levo uh, rotatory uh, came from latin word levers which means on the left side the magnitude of the observed rotation uh, depends uh, put, uh, on the length of the sample tube it also depends on temperature and solvent uh, as well as the wavelength of the light used so therefore uh, observed rotation does not have uh, uh, that particular use because it, it varies a lot with different conditions however specific rotation uh, is more used parameter in optically active in optical activity of various organic molecule now specific rotation is denoted by alpha in square brackets and it is defined as observed rotation at specific cell length and specific concentration now specific cell length is 10 decimeter uh, 10 deci uh, sorry 1 decimeter and 1 decimeter is equals to 10 centimeter so the length of the sample tube must be 10 centimeter and the concentration must be 1 gram per ml for a pure liquid
uh, one gram per ml for a uh, for a solid and for a pure liquid the concentration must be expressed in grams per ml or uh, it has to be density when we report either uh, specific rotation or observed rotation uh, a dextro rotatory compound is indicated with a plus sign in parentheses for example uh, in this case, uh, this uh, stereoisomer of lactic acid, the S, uh, uh, is a dextrorotatory compound and its specific rotation is uh, positive 2.6 degrees. It means it rotates the plane polarized light to the positive direction. So hence, it, uh, we include the uh, plus sign in its name in parentheses. The other uh, enantiomer of lactic acid, the mirror image of uh, uh, S, which would be R, if this is S, the other one would be R, uh, must be levorotatory. So it means it will rotate the plane polarized light to the negative direction. So hence the name also contains the symbol negative. One thing I would like to uh, clarify here is that the con in gold pre-go uh, pre-log notation or in other words the rs configuration has nothing to do with the optical activity in this particular example the s uh, enantiomer is a, a dextrorotatory but that does not mean that all s enantiomer will be dextrorotatory optical activity is experimentally measured um, property and sometimes some R uh, enantiomer may have dextro and in other cases the S may be dextrorotatory. So RS configuration has nothing to do with the uh, optical activity of uh, those enantiomers. From RS uh, configuration only thing we can say is that they will be optically active. They will rotate uh, the plane polarized light but we cannot predict which direction they will rotate the plane polarized light if they may rotate to the right or clockwise or anti-clockwise that has to be measured experimentally if we have an equal amount of r enantiomer and s enantiomer uh, in a mixture of any optically active compound and th then that mixture is known as a racemic mixture. So racemic mixture is equimolar. It means 50% R enantiomer plus 50% S enantiomer. It is also shown as R plus S. <clears throat> the term uh, racemic uh, is de derived from the name uh, racemic uh, uh, acid and racemic is actually uh, a Greek word for cluster of grapes. So racemic came from cluster of grapes. Uh, this uh, uh, term was actually initially given to an equimolar mixture of uh, tartaric acid because tartaric acid uh, comes from uh, uh, the grape juice. Uh, so the 50% uh, R isomer of tartaric acid and 50% S uh, that uh, uh, the term racemic mixture was given to it. But now the semic mixture is used for all uh, mixture of uh, enantiomers uh, which contains equimolar amount of each um, uh, enantiomer. Now because uh, our enantiomer or one of the enantiomer will rotate the light optically to the right side and other enantiomer uh, rotate the plane polarized light to the left side or clockwise anti-clockwise so hence if we have 50 percent one enantiomer and 50 percent another one they will cancel each other out effect so therefore racemic mixture is optically inactive 
In other words, the racemic mixture do not rotate the plane polarized light. The other way uh, to describe the composition of mixture of enantiomers is by enantiomeric excess. It is also denoted by EE. Enantiomeric excess in percent is calculated by taking the difference in percentage of each enantiomer. For example, a mixture of 75% R and 25% S, this mixture has enantiomeric excess or percent enantiomeric excess of 75 minus 25 equals 50% only. Both <clears throat> enantiomeric excess and optically optical purity are measured experimentally. So in exams, you may see uh, some problems similar to this one. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, an example of uh, an optically active molecule is given. So this molecule is the S naproxen. Uh, by the way, this is one of the common uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. And <clears throat> a commercial synthesis of this molecule gives S enantiomer in 97% enantiomeric excess. It means S enantiomer is in excess. So calculate the percentage of R and S. So we need to calculate the individual percentages of R isomer and S isomer. By formula, we know that EE or percent EE is equals to percentage of S because that's in excess minus percentage of R. And we know that this value is equals to 97%. In other words, <clears throat> percentage of S minus percentage of R in enantiomer equals 97%. But we know that whenever we have mixture of two, so this combined sum of both of those two component is always equals to 100%, right? So if we add them up, so that's 100. So difference between S and R is 97. The sum between these two is Nine, uh, 100. So if we add these two equations together, so this one and this one, so we will end up, uh, so percent S, so left hand side all together. Equals 97 plus 100. So this will be the combined equation by which we obtained by adding equation number one and equation number two. So in this case, we have a, a negative percent R and positive percent R, so they cancel each other out. Uh, so the remaining equation is two times percentage S is equals to 197. Or in other words, percent S is equals to 197 divided by two and this comes out to be 98.5. So if uh, S is 97, uh, 98.5, so we can plug in the value of uh, S in equation number one, and we will find that the R is equals to 1.5%. 
and this would be the answer and that's how we solve the enantiomeric excess problems except for inorganic salts and relatively few low molecular weight organic substances all other molecules in living system both in plant as well as animal are chiral so although these molecules can exist as a number of stereoisomers because they have multiple chiral centers but generally only one of those stereoisomer is produced and used in a given biological system in other words all the molecules in biological world are highly specific the stereo specificity of uh, uh, biological molecules can be illustrated by considering the example of uh, uh, chemotrypsin chemotrypsin is an enzyme which is found in intestines of animals and this enzyme catalyzes the hydrolysis of proteins during digestion chemotrypsin like all uh, other proteins is composed of long molecular chain of amino acids which fold up into the active enzyme human chemotrypsin contains 268 chiral centers that's a staggering amount of chiral center uh, in in a single molecule so according to the formula of uh, 2 to the n we can theoretically calculate the number of uh, uh, possible stereoisomers and that number is 2 to the power 268 this number is huge extremely large one comparison uh, is uh, by comparing our the number of stars in our ga galaxy we have only 2 to the power 38 stars in our galaxy so it means the maximum number of stereoisomers possible in chemotrypsin is i can't even comprehend uh, the total number but probably you can imagine it's much 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 greater than the total number of stars in our galaxy enzymes are chiral catalysts some are completely specific for the catalysis of the reaction of only one particular compound whereas other enzymes are less specific and they can catalyze similar reactions of a family of compounds an enzyme catalyzes a biological reaction of molecule by first positioning them uh, at the binding site on its surface for example this represents the uh, surface of the enzyme and uh, the molecule which uh, this enzyme will break down or catalyzes to break down is called substrate so in the first step uh, the enzyme uh, positions the substrate towards its binding site as you can see that enzymes are so specific that their positions matches only with one of the enantiomer the other enantiomer the mirror image of it it will fit partially but because it will not fit all the binding sites therefore the enzymes will not catalyze it will not catalyze the uh, mirror image of its substrate so therefore enzyme can selectively uh, hydrolyze or break down or react or catalyze one of the enantiomer and leave the other enantiomer alone the separation of racemic mixture into enantiomers is known as resolution so we can say resolution means separation of racemic mixtures as mentioned earlier enantiomers have the same physical properties such as boiling point melting point and solubility 
therefore traditional separation techniques which rely on these properties cannot be used to separate enantiomers from each other earlier we learned that diastereomers have different physical properties such as their melting points and boiling points and solubility are different uh, from one another so therefore one method of uh, separation of enantiomer is to convert a pair of enantiomer into two diastereomers so if we can convert enantiomers into diastereomers then their solubility and melting point will be different so then they can easily be uh, separated from one another now this method is particularly used for those uh, pair of enantiomers which have an acid group present in them this method was uh, discovered by louis pasteur uh, uh, in 1841 and um, louis pasteur at that time was working with tartaric acid and the tartaric acid naturally occurs as a racemic mixture and um, and he noticed that when uh, tartaric acid was reacted with uh, another base and base was also chiral he found that after the reaction and uh, a salt was formed we know that acid plus base gives formation to salt but what he found was that the salt had two distinct components and and he was able to separate those two distinct components because those uh, two components were diastereomers of each other so in this method uh, we can separate a enantiomeric mixture of any acidic uh, optically active compound if we react it with a chiral base this is important base must also be chiral and it has to be optically pure we cannot use a uh, enantiomeric mixture of a base so when this reacts uh, so it will form two different salts so one will be the salt where our enantiomer of our acid and our enantiomer of our base which is pure R will form so this is called r and r salt and the other one will be where the s enantiomer from the acid reacts with our salt so this will be s and r salt now <clears throat> these two uh, resulting salts are diastereomers of each other because they no longer will be the mirror images and their properties such as solubilities and other physical properties will be drastically different so uh, because of that uh, these salts can be easily separated and the next step is once you get the salt then salt is easily reversed by adding any achiral acid such as uh, any acid any achiral acid and it will give us back our r carboxylic acid optically pure and the uh, the similar reaction with s and r will uh, give us our s carboxylic acid in enantiomeric group one of the common bases which is used uh, in separation of racemic mixture is uh, s1 phenyl uh, ethanamine or r iso uh, stereo isomer of uh, the same compound So this technique is particularly used uh, for separation of uh, 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 acidic uh, uh, racemic mixtures such as tartaric acid, malic acid, and camphoric acid. Another approach to separate racemic mixture of enantiomer is the use of enzymes. Earlier we saw that enzymes are quite specific in binding or hydrolyzing one uh, kind of enantiomer and they leave the other enantiomer alone. 
So this kind of uh, separation can be seen in the synthesis process of uh, the anti-inflammatory drug called uh, naproxen. Only the S uh, stereoisomer of naproxen is the active ingredient of that drug and R stereoisomer is uh, the non-active ingredient. So therefore in the actual product, uh, we need to have only the S naproxen. But when this uh, uh, drug is uh, synthesized, the uh, precursor to the final product is a racemic mixture of both R, uh, both S uh, enantiomer as well as R enantiomer. In the final N uh, naproxen uh, formula, as you can see, we have a carboxylic acid group. The precursor to this molecule has an ester group here. In both the R <clears throat> enantiomer as well as S enantiomer, we have ester group. So both of these molecules are insoluble in water. So at this uh, step, an enzyme called esterase is used. So esterase is a class of enzymes which bind with the ester group and it hydrolyzes the ester group into acids. The other property of uh, this enzyme is that this enzyme is uh, specific to only the S uh, uh, stereoisomer of uh, uh, this naproxen molecule or ethyl ester of naproxen molecule. So this enzyme will bind with the S uh, uh, stereoisomer of uh, this uh, ethyl ester of uh, S naproxen and leave this other R isomer alone. It will not bind. After binding, the enzyme will hydrolyze the uh, ethyl uh, ester group and change this ethyl group into, uh, sorry, change this ester group into carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acid is then treated with sodium hydroxide and converted into the salt of carboxylic uh, uh, group. Now that because now carboxylic acid is present as in the salt form, therefore its solubility will be much more greater in water. Uh, and we already uh, stated that in the ester group does not dissolve in water. So therefore, the salt of this molecule, which has already been hydrolyzed, will dissolve in water and we can simply filter it. After filtration, we can add more acid and addition of acid will uh, generate our acid group back and we will get the pure S uh, uh, stereoisomer of naproxen. This is one of the most common method used in the synthesis of this drug. So with that, we conclude this chapter. In this chapter, we learned about stereoisomerism and chirality. Uh, we discussed about what is chirality, what are enantiomers, and what are uh, diastereomers. We also learned the method to uh, identify them, what is the R enantiomer and what is the S enantiomer. And then we discussed, discussed about Fisher projection formulas. Fisher projection formulas are a great way to express the structures of uh, carbohydrates. And uh, we also discussed about what is optical activity and optical purity as well as enantiomeric access. And finally, we learned about uh, the methods to separate uh, uh, the enantiomeric mixtures. Uh, thank you for watching uh, this uh, uh, video. And if you have any question, please let me know. Thank you very much.